the political current that obviously prevails in the modern world should be called the fanaticism of formal democracy. It is fanaticism because this current has turned its password into a confession of faith, into a panacea, into a criterion of good and evil, into an object of blind loyalty and oath, as if one has to choose only between a totalitarian regime and a formal democracy, because there is nothing left, although in fact there is much more. It is the fanaticism of formal democracy which reduces the entire state system to a form of universal and equal suffrage, turning away from man's quality and the inner dignity of his intentions and goals, reconciling with the freedom of malice and treachery, reducing the whole thing to the clairvoyance of a ballot and arithmetic of votes, quantity. But in reality, such a democracy does not protect against anything, neither from universal bribery, nor from treacherous conspiracies, nor from the general exploitation of the weak, good, uneducated and stupid by deceivers, nor from anarchy, nor from tyranny, nor from totalitarianism. History, 1914-1945, has just given new cruel lessons, which were added to the previous ones, from the Greco-Roman era, from the Renaissance era and from the revolutions of recent times. But does the fanatic pay attention to the lessons of historical experience? How many times have formal democracies degenerated, lost their creative power and destroyed states? And we, Russian patriots, must necessarily come up with that question and agree with each other. The democratic system is not always desirable. It has its necessary bases or assumptions, if there are none then there is nothing but long-term disintegration and ruin, in the name of that same democracy. The Art of Freedom First, the people must understand freedom, have a need for it, know how to appreciate it, know how to use it and fight for it. All this together should be called the Art of Freedom. If it does not exist, democracy is doomed. The point is that democracy does not consist in liberation, in negative sense of the people at all, but in replacing the external obligation, which goes from above, with internal, self-discipline. A free people know their own rights. They keep themselves within the borders of honor and law, they know why they were given freedom, they fill it with true creative initiative, in religion, in local self-government, in the economy, in communication, in science and in art. They will not follow the scoundrels who deceive them with the permissibility of everything, but will force them to shut up. They will not allow the totalitarians to take away their freedom, but will defend it. People deprived of the skills of freedom will suffer from two classic dangers, anarchy and tyranny. If people accept freedom as the permissibility of everything, and if they start abusing it, trampling on all laws, breaking into other people's apartments, stealing other people's property and killing their real and imaginary enemies, burning and destroying, anarchy will ensue, which will lead the country and the state to ruin from the beginning, only to be replaced by tyranny, sometimes internal, sometimes foreign, occupying. If a people do not realize that they need freedom and if they do not know how to use it, they will hand it over to any adventurer in exchange for the promise of personal or class gain they will sell it to that tyrant who will be able to ignite their passions, to organize his shameless staff, to attract people with unattainable plans and to reward the mob with bread and games. Then democracy will fail. History has testified to this countless times. Is it not clear that the first danger, anarchy, befell Russia in 1917, and that its accomplice was Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin, and that the second danger, tyranny, befell Germany in 1933 and that its accomplice was Adolf Hitler. Legal Awareness Another assumption of creative democracy is a sufficiently high level of legal awareness. In each of us there are two forces, which are generally opposed to each other, the force of instinct and the force of spirit. Instinct, taken by itself and untamed by spirit, is the wolf in man, it is predatory, corrupt and cruel but it is more cunning and capricious than the forest wolf. A man of naked instinct knows neither faith, nor conscience, nor compassion, nor honor, he mocks honor, ridicules goodness, does not believe in any principles. For him, 
Good is everything that suits him. He seeks power and wealth. He is exactly as Friedrich Nietzsche described him with thrill and admiration in his anti-Christian work The Will to Power, in which he calls us to move towards the supreme beast, the wild and evil man with a cheerful roar, with rough and wild nature, towards the ungodly enjoyer, the spirit in man, the principle of the heart, reasonable will, responsible presence and conscience, opposes the spiritless instinct. The spirit appears in thirst for holy, in the search for God, in the ability of self-control and in active love. Legal consciousness is one of its basic manifestations, I am a person with spiritual dignity and rights, I know what I can, must and must not, and I respect the same free and responsible person in every other person. A man who has a sound legal consciousness is a free subject of law, he has the will for loyalty, obedience to the law, he will be able to protect his own and other people's rights, obligations and prohibitions, he is a living support of the legal order, self-government, army and state. A man deprived of legal consciousness is like a beast and behaves like a wolf. A man who is able to obey only out of fear turns into a wolf as soon as the fear disappears. A man without a sense of responsibility and honor is incapable of both personal and social self-government and therefore incapable of democracy. If there is no sound legal awareness among the people, the democratic system will turn into a system of abuse and crime. Unprincipled people and scums are bribe takers, they know this about each other, and they cover each other, people commit treason, benefit from it and they call it democracy. Only a strict authoritarian, by no means totalitarian, regime can save them and the country from ruin. Economic independence. The third assumption is the independence of the citizen's business. By that I do not mean wealth, nor entrepreneurship, nor ownership of land, but personal ability and social ability to feed your family with honest, even hired work. A free citizen must feel himself in life as an independent worker, who is not thrown out of the life of his country, but is instinctively involved in real life flows. Only he who feels capable of being a breadwinner of himself and of benefiting his people has a basis for independent judgment in politics for the sake of an incorruptible expression of his will and vote. He has a certain creative rootedness under his feet, and in his soul a true way of thinking, which leads him to a correct understanding of the state household and a correct sense of state needs and necessities. Without this, democracy turns into a constant quarrel of unrooted rivals, no one thinks about the state and its structure, about the fatherland and its salvation, because everyone is busy with personal income. A man, personally incapable of honest work, is a professional of dark skills, a dangerous scum, a master of deception, a corrupt villain. He lives outside the legal order and legal consciousness and that is why he is a political idiot. After the lost wars, civil wars and other revolutions, there are countless such adventurers in the country, unaccustomed to work, who are created to destroy and destroy every democracy. Lucky ones become successful businessmen, the unsuccessful ones create ready-made hired personnel for all possible pseudo-generals, radical parties, foreign espionage and bandits. A man who does not have the social ability to feed his family with honest work is a tragic phenomenon of the unemployed. He is not to blame for his misfortune, and he often watches in horror as long-term unemployment demoralizes and kills him. It is difficult to deal with mass unemployment, because it is caused by complex causes, economic crises, overpopulation, economic backwardness of the country, destructive wars and revolutions and those causes are easier to remove with the genius initiative of one man, if one is found, than with parliamentary disagreements. Democracy also suffers from the abundance in the country and the mob, unaccustomed for honest work and which craves for bribery, fun and adventure. The historian will, of course, remember the degeneration of ancient Roman democracy, the disintegration of the Italian bourgeoisie during the Renaissance the Red and White Rose War in England, the Thirty Years' War in Germany, and the First French Revolution.
he will also remember the 7 million unemployed in pre-Hitler Germany, he will include some states in modern Europe, and to all this he will add his prognosis for Russia after Bolshevism. Having established the basic assumptions of a living and creative democracy, we must further point out the following, education and awareness. There is a minimum level of education and awareness, without which any voting becomes its own caricature. It is not only elementary literacy that is necessary here, which allows a person to write his name and surname in letters instead of a fingerprint dipped in ink. Here it is necessary to understand the election process and the proposed programs, mentally evaluate the candidates, understand the state and economic structure of the country and its needs, properly understand the political, international and military dangers, and, of course, the availability of accurate information. In 1917, Grandma Avdata spoke about her participation in the election of the Constituent Assembly, I came to the local office there. As many people as you want, they ask, you, Grandma, came to the elections, yeah, yeah, the election. Who are you? Where are you from, Avdata Mite Jaskina from Pogalak. They wrote that on the paper, put a cross on my palm and said, go, grandmother, home, you voted, I came home. This is how the socialist revolutionaries formed their majority and constitutional assemblies. It is also insufficient education that receives a properly written check from the party secretary that awaits literate voters as they approach the ballot boxes. There is a level of low education and ignorance in which the people do not vote, but the mob which they deceive, from this, not democracy but eclectricity, the power of the unenlightened mob, is born. One should be completely naive and imagine that, ostensibly, those people who have been insidiously deceived for 30-40 years are suddenly able to become conscious citizens tomorrow, able to understand what is state damage and what is political benefit, it is only necessary to proclaim freedom and equality and, everyone will immediately declare themselves supporters of the Republic and the Federation of Kierensky and Fedotov because they will correctly understand what is good for the state. Political experience. But even this is not enough, political experience is necessary, of which, in the future Russia both educated class and less educated masses will be deprived. You need to imagine and present everything clearly to yourself. For 34 years in a row by hunger, fear and torture they have been weaning people from independent thinking, from political and economic initiative, from responsible resolution, and from morning to evening, from birth to death, they filled people's souls with deadly and false schemes of vulgar Marxism and the meanness of dialectical materialism. What kind of citizens, what kind of democrats was prepared by the communist government? Not citizens, but slaves of a totalitarian state, not politicians, but death-scared careerists, not workers, but sycophants and deliverers, they were created by the Soviet regime, people completely deprived of the state-building horizon and honest, yes, just honest, experience and independent, yes, just independent understanding. A man who had been in prison for thirty years, tired in chains, who had weaned from standing and walking, what kind of participant in a sports competition would he be? and democracy is precisely a political sports competition. That man should be led by the hand, and not loaded with bags of tens of kilograms of responsibility. What naivety, what irresponsibility, what historical blindness is needed to be able to imagine that the habits of a totalitarian commander and a totalitarian slave can create a democracy that would look like something how lowly modern democrats from Russia appreciate this regime in which they swear. Years, years must pass until the hour when a Russian man will come to his senses, shake off those humiliating habits and, standing up, find his way of life, his dignity, his Russian independence and his gifted ingenuity. There is such a political inexperience in which people's self-government is impossible, and in which democracy can only be falsified as during the shameful Constituent Assembly of 1917. That is exactly what some are hoping for. Personal character, loyalty to the fatherland and civic courage. However, real, 
Creative democracy implies in man a whole series of properties and abilities without which it becomes a deceptive hypocrisy and a sale of the national heritage. A person who participates in a democratic system needs personal character and loyalty to the homeland, traits that ensure a certain view, incorruptibility, responsibility and civic courage. If that is not the case, he is desolation, a cardboard brick in the wall, a rotten log, a rusty ring in the chain, a traitor secured in advance. A democratic regime in which such people prevail does not fall only if there is no one to push it. Characterless people are incapable of any good venture, they just look like people, they are fake sizes. Citizens taught internationalism are citizens of all other countries except their own. Voters, who do not have defined views and who do not know how to defend them, are similar to children's balloons, from which other people's air comes out noisily while they blow themselves out and fall. And what about the bribe takers? Because only foreigners will have money, and it is difficult to blame bribery on the poor. A man deprived of a sense of responsibility must not be allowed to engage in any public work, he will ruin everything, and then he will escape and hide in the crowd, behind its many-headed relentlessness. And civic courage is an essential condition of life, for every democrat, in every democracy. It would be futile to point to the history of western nations. At least because it's a different history. And also because none of the Western nations sought salvation in a democracy after 30 40 years of totalitarianism. And especially because what brings health to one nation brings death to another. And how not to ask yourself, why is democracy so difficult for the Balkan, Asian, and South American peoples? Did democracy save or destroy Spain? Why did Germany, which began the history of its democracy a hundred years ago, end in a totalitarian collapse. Why can't a democratic regime, which is implemented according to all parliamentary rules, never pull modern France out of the ravine, regardless of its political experience, civilization and citizenship? What is the healing power of democracy in modern Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary and Romania? Shouldn't the winning tone be rejected once and for all, when the democratic experience of the West is used as an argument? And let no emigrant publicist be found who, in spite of everything, will dare to attribute to us a hidden sympathy for the totalitarian regime. We saw the left totalitarianism and right-wing totalitarianism, we have experienced both of these regimes, all the way to arrests, interrogations, threats bans, and more. We had the opportunity to examine both regimes to the bottom and treat them with undisguised moral and political disgust. But we think of democracy much more sublimely and better than gentlemen formal democrats. And we claim the following. A country deprived of the preconditions necessary for a healthy creative democracy must not introduce that regime until the basic preconditions are created for it. Until then, the introduction of a democratic system can only be perilous for that country.